welcome to uh, this latest episode of Totally Unscripted. And um, I'm delighted today uh, to be joined by uh, our Bugger Faces with um, Steve Webster and Bruce McPherson, but we're also joined by uh, Zig Mandel. So uh, Zig, I'm sure, is uh, a name you recognize from uh, places like Stack Overflow. Uh, he's a big contributor to not just Google Apps Script, but other uh, products and services that Google have to offer. Um, so welcome, Zig, to uh, this show. Thank you. Um, so uh, as usual, we're going to uh, just kick off uh, initially with a, a, just a kind of a look at what's in, in the news right now uh, with Google Apps Script. So there's a couple of things that have come out recently. So um, uh, this first one, uh, Steve, I think you picked up on uh, I don't know if many many people remember that there, you can actually develop add-ons uh, for Android for the, the the Google Suite apps of Docs Sheets. Um, but you you picked up this item quite recently, Steve. Is some more things you'd like to say to this? Sure. Yeah, I noticed the article, and I just thought it was interesting. From one year from the announcement of having add-ons uh, working through the Android operating system. There were no new <laughs> uh, apps available. And so I started a discussion on the Google Plus community for add on. And so we did see that. And you can read more if you visit the add on yeah. community. Yep. I, I did a presentation not too long ago for the Edinburgh Mobile Development Group, and I basically told them avoid um, add ons for uh, Android add ons for uh, App Script because. Uh, I just don't think the implementation was is really there. But we've we've seen with the, the Gmail uh, developer preview that that the uh, where the add-ons are actually implemented differently. So um, that looks more promising. And I think um, we previously talked about how we very much see this new model that they have for Gmail add-ons as as the way forward. So and I think as well, Steve, you were mentioning that you know it's very easy to develop uh, responsive apps as well. Um, so uh, there's lots of other solutions for this. But yeah. um, Gmail does look good, except I'm concerned about not being able to override the UI. Um, because some add-ons can be very complex, and the out-of-the-box UI experience that they're using this card stuff may not be good enough. So that's yeah. Good. Yeah, we'll see how that one uh, pans out. So uh, moving on, so... Um, this was another one, Steve, that you picked up. So, um, uh, web apps and add-ons uh, whitelisting. Do you want to talk a bit more to this one? Sure. Um, so, on one hand, we've always had for a long time now the ability, let's say, with add-ons, to say, I want to publish my add-on so it's on the uh, Chrome Web Store, if you will. So, if you're in a Google spreadsheet, for example, you can browse add-ons. But it's also possible when you publish to have a little check mark to go to the marketplace. Then, when you're the uh, administrator for a, a company or a domain, you can whitelist uh, these third-party add-ons or web apps. And so that's been around for a while. But what's new is hooking it up to certain services within the domain. Uh, am I allowing this app or add-on access to, let's say, the contact service? So there's another scrutiny of authorization there. I haven't fully digested it yet, but that's that's what it appears to be uh, going on. And I've got some links that we can share after the uh, uh, broadcast. Yeah, another interesting button. And as Steve says, we'll, we'll share out the links as well, so you can um, look at that in, in more detail. Um, I think it as well it kind of relates to the whole professionalization theme that we, we've got going today uh, in terms of where, where our script is, is heading. Um, so a couple, couple of just other, um, I came across some really nice um, community contributions recently, and I thought I'd just flag these if you haven't seen them. So the uh, the first one's from uh, Kanchi. So um, what was impressive about this, um, he's, he's published a, a library which um, has image tools. So um, what the, the library does is it, it's able to extract things like um, uh, uh, image file type uh, dimensions. Um, so if that's something you need within uh, your 
you know, when you're developing stuff within that script, um, there's a nice library to do it. What really impressed me was he actually went into the DNA of um, the, the the image file. So he was looking at uh, decoding the, the the kind of the raw bytes um, to work out file types, and um, so that, that was uh, impressive stuff. So uh, again, there'll be uh, links after the show if you want to have to look at that. And everyone um, came via Ken Lane, who's uh, API evangelist. So. Um, uh, he, he highlighted some, some work people have been doing. Basically, you know, with URL fetch, there's so many opportunities in terms of integrating into other products and services. So um, if you do need some machine learning into your, your spreadsheet, then um, there's uh, more details uh, on, on how you can do that. Um, so really nice to see um, the community sharing um, bits and pieces. And uh, if there's anything yeah, you spot in the community, um, that you 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 like us to to highlight as part of the show, then uh, feel free to ping us so you can get us on the totally unscripted um, page and there's various contact forms and things like that. We've got um, Zig here, so uh, and I want to give Zig plenty of time to to talk about what what he's got today. So. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the, of the show, uh, Zig's a huge contributor to the AppScript community, and particularly with what he does on, on Stack Overflow. Um, but it's not just AppScript with Zig. He, he's very familiar with a range of products and platforms. Uh, and we thought we'd um, get Zig along and talk about some of the, the recent work he's been doing in this area. So Zig, tell us more about what you've been up to recently. Uh, sure. First, you hear me okay, fine? Yeah. All right. Um, well, I've been looking at Google Cloud Functions, and the primary reason I looked at it was, uh, well, first, I know JavaScript pretty well. Uh, I learned it with AppScript, and uh, it was natural, like the natural next step was to look at something that sometimes can be a little bit more powerful, than AppScript, but he uses the same language. So it was pretty easy to pick it up. Um, and uh, I needed to do it, in my case, for a backend for Stripe. Stripe.com is a payment uh, handler, and I needed to charge for a service. So I ended up doing it with Cloud Functions. So I'm going to present a representation here on the screen. So with this uh, link is really the, the way for you to get started. I'm going to share this, uh, the URL of the presentation itself as well at the end. Uh, basically, it uses node.js, which is a whole uh, different topic uh, to talk about. I will not talk much about node. Uh, but the great thing is that it uses JavaScript, and that was good enough for me to, to start learning it. Here is why you would want to use it. Uh, this is my top five, but you can probably find uh, more reasons. The first one is, well, handling a request. Just like in AppScript, you can have a, a do get or do post. You can also do this in uh, Cloud Functions and have an on request, uh, which can have a handle post, get, and I don't know, any REST uh, call, any HTTP or HTTPS call. Uh, one great thing about Cloud Functions is that you can map them to a custom domain. Uh, and you'll see why that's great uh, in point four later. So number two, uh, respond to events. And this is also something great that well, AppScript doesn't have a built-in, really. Uh, the, the A, the first one, is events about the database. And uh, this is also a big topic that's very interesting that you should look at if you haven't looked into Firebase database. It's a real-time database. And uh, for example, whenever you or anybody or another app adds a node into your database, you can say, hey, call this function in my, in my cloud function. So you can react when a node is added or change it or whatever. 
and not was not just by you, of course, but by anybody outside of your app. Uh, the second uh, trigger you can handle is authentication. That's also built into Firebase. You can have a login with multiple providers, including custom name and password. And so you can have a trigger. So when a new user signs up, maybe you want to send them an email saying hi. And the third one is for analytics. These are the new Firebase analytic events. And also you can, they are better in some ways to Google analytics because they happen real time and without aggregation of the totals. Uh, and you can react also real time with a trigger from an analytic uh, call. The fourth one, the fourth one is a uh, cloud storage. Like if you or somebody else uh, puts a file on a folder, uh, you can have your call function get called. And also for the last one, PubSub. Also a great thing to, to look into if you haven't looked into it. It's like a way to store, uh, it's like a queue where you can put stuff without having to react instantly. And then you can put uh, pull things from it. Uh, and also whenever a message arrives to the pops up, you can get a call into your call function, so you react. Uh, so, Besides push events, you can also uh, register a webhook, which is the reason I did it for Stripe. So, uh, for example, when a customer uh, charge a fails, when Stripe fails to charge uh, a credit card, then it calls a webhook into my call function, and so I can email the user and say, "Hey, your credit card is not letting me charge you," something like that. And um, the fourth one is, is, is really a great one. I should be at, at the very top. Uh, it's uh, you can you can make a backend for a front end app. So Firebase also has Firebase hosting, which runs on top of Google Cloud Storage, and so you can have your your front end app stored there, like a HTML, CSS, JS app. Uh, but the backend can be in cloud functions. And because of because you can assign custom domains, uh, you can avoid problems of uh, cross domain requests and such because then your Firebase hosting app is on the same domain as your cloud functions backend, and it's just a regular full fledged uh, app web app. Uh, the fifth one I, is just a is one more reason really. Uh, in my company, we tend to make uh, a Google Cloud Platform scripts or launching instances or doing batch operations, and we used to put them in Linux uh, scripts, shell scripts, with GSU2, for example. But it turns out that sometimes it's much more practical to have it in a cloud function, and then uh, you know it's auto scales, uh, etc., which is what we'll see next. On the next slide, this is really the reason I wanted to give this talk, which is uh, to compare it with other existing platforms. Mostly I looked into App Engine because that's what I was using in my company for big auto scaling systems. And it turns out that many of them can be done in cloud functions, sometimes easier. Uh, so here's a comparison at the top of the, just like a raw potency that you can get on a single instance, of course. Uh, right now in Cloud Functions, you can choose five potencies. You can see there the ranges of CPU and RAM, you know, from 128 megabytes to two gigabytes of RAM. So that's pretty good. Uh, about concurrent requests, which is really the, the meat of this. <laughs> Is uh, that you can you know automatic you can call concurrently your cloud function, and Google automatically takes care of the auto scaling. Uh, that's something that we sometimes suffer in App Script because we have time limits uh, per function and, and per day and per concurrency as well. Uh, and this one is more well, it's bigger. Uh, Four hundred concurrent requests is really a lot. Uh, unless you need something really, really huge. Uh, App Engine can do more, but not really, because 
uh, if you see here my, my calculation, it says uh, 1,600 concurrent calls. But that, recall, that requires some tweaking in App Engine. For example, uh, there is a variable in App Engine called max concurrent requests, which is how many requests a single instance can have. And you can put it all the way to 80 instead of 8, which means a single instance can have uh, 80 threads created on it. And that means your threads will end up sharing memory and such. So it's not, you know, yeah, you can scale it to 1600, but each node will be to power RAM specifically. So in cloud functions, not so, right? Each, each of the 400 has its own uh, instance guaranteed with the power that you specified uh, when you chose your, your potency. Uh, up, up to now, uh, some comments or questions that you guys have? Um, I'm just wondering, have you, um, in, in your experiences so far, hit into the limits of with cloud functions and, and the, I think it was 400 concurrent? Have, if I have okay. reached them? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, well, in the in the case that I've implemented the cloud function, it's for handling licenses. So mm -hmm. I would love to have four hundred people <laughs> try to purchase my app concurrently, <laughs> but that doesn't happen. Uh, and um, in, in my case, it's really more than enough four hundred, uh, and, and it's in beta cloud functions. I should have started by that. So maybe they will make it more powerful mm -hmm. later. Um, but uh, it's concurrent. You have to take that into account. I mean, mm -hmm. your request can take only 50 milliseconds maybe to, to, to finish. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to have so many concurrent requests built up unless your function is uh, taking a long time to finish. So, uh, yeah, Zig, I've got a question. Um, one of the things about the app engine is that if you're using the flexible instance, which you will need to if you're using Node, um, there isn't a free tier. Uh, so in other words, you, you, you're paying right away, and you're, you're uh -huh. paying not for usage, but you're paying for existence. So uh -huh. it, can, it can be quite expensive. So if you had 20 instances, that would be like super expensive. But on the cloud function, you've got a certain, some some like, I don't know, 2 million calls or something that are free in a month, haven't you? What's, what's the, do you know what the number is? I don't know the number uh, by memory, but yeah. I looked at it and it was huge for my case. Yeah for my usage, it does have a, a, like, I have my app for a few months already online and with many thousands, thousands of users, uh, the, the cloud function is not only used for licenses, it's only it's also used for other things. So many users are using it every day, like every second I go in there and people are calling the functions. And so far I haven't been charged. Ah, okay, that's good. As I say, I mean, uh, app engine can cost you um, you know, 50, 60 buck, bucks a month and you don't really do anything with it. So yeah, it's a, no, I, it's a, yeah, I it's haven't a, paid it any. And I'm using storage, functions, triggers, uh, yeah. many things, a database, database too. Uh, yeah. But that's what well, you mentioned is inflexible because in the engine standard, you have also a very lax quotas. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and if you're using uh, Java or Python or something like that, then mm -hmm. You know, you, you get loads of stuff for free, but for some reason they haven't done that in the flex environment. Yeah, I mean, that's because they haven't. Eventually, I think App Engine will become just flexible, and then everything will have maybe the quota will go away. <laughs> but but they can't. It's a language thing. The the platform they have only works on on uh, Python and Java, well, and, and Go. Uh, what else here? Uh, well, yeah, it's important what I say, right? It's it, it, the, the, put it the right weight for your needs because you cannot just say 1600 is bigger than 400. So App Engine is better because in the App Engine case, you, have, you are sharing RAM across many threads if you really push it to that limit. So in reality, App Engine is more like with a standard limit of eight threads instead of 80. You have to divide by 10, the 1600, so you end up with 160 concurrent calls if you don't tweak uh, 
that. So that's less than 400. So it's you know it's hard to say which is better, uh, but both are both handle very well the concurrent requests, and also the the response times, uh, which is also something that. Uh, can help you uh, compared to AppScript. In AppScript, you have sometimes five minutes, sometimes six minutes. Uh, I'm not sure which is which. I think is six minutes now uh, maximum time uh, for a single call. While in Cloud Functions, you get nine minutes, and it's really great nine minutes, especially compared to App Engine, which gives you one minute. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes one minute. Many times it's not enough, and you have to play many tricks with. No, it, you complicate things in App Engine if you need more time. So that time for that cloud function is great, and uh, also in App in, in there's also response times for uh, doing like a fetch, like in App Script. Also, you're like there's a so much time that Google will wait for a fetch, and in App Engine too. And not so with cloud functions. You have more control with that. Uh, the next thing I have is a little screenshot of what you get from Firebase. Uh, it's important to note that if you're starting on cloud functions, there's two ways to start. You can look at the cloud functions documentations from Google. Or you can go uh, for uh, to firebase.google.com and look at it from there. And in Firebase, it's much better. It's integrated into their database and, and their triggers. Yeah, and you can do more from there than from the Google Cloud uh, Platform documentation. So here you see uh, that there's a functions tab on the left. And uh, it shows you the functions that you have launched. and it also has the next panel. Yeah, really, at the top you see the it's in Spanish. Sorry, but it's control panel, and then uh, your logs, which it says registros here. Logs is uh, automatic logs, like whenever the function is called. But also, if you do console dot log and put whatever there, it ends up in this log. And this is really great because you can connect it with Stack Driver and do something like whenever a log with level error uh, or it contains such and such string, uh, email me and check it every minute. And so, right, so so I if if I put errors in my console, uh, I don't have to do anything special. I just get an email whenever something weird happens, and it has helped me a lot to uh, debug things and to catch things very quickly before the user notices if there's a bug, for example. So that's what I have uh, for for uh, Cloud Functions. Uh, we can really talk a lot more about it, but I think it goes a little bit uh, off the, the topic. Uh, if you have uh, questions or comments, I'll be happy to answer them. Hi, this is Rudy in Dallas. I was just wondering, what was that l difference in the two links of accessing Firebase? Uh, be between, let's see. Accessing it on Google Cloud versus yes. accessing it directly. Oh, there it is. Yes, this link, uh, firebase.google.com, uh, get started, is the one that I recommend. Uh, because if you go, with the, let's go to it. But first, it's really, it's really well done, ex the explanation of the steps to install a node and everything. Uh, I really didn't know anything about node, and this page was all I needed to get started. Within cool. maybe two minutes, you can have, well, maybe five minutes, you can have a Cloud Function deployed and working if you start from zero from this page. Uh, there is also the... Um, If you just Google it, you, what you get is this. And this is more confusing. It's like the standard format of Google documentation. But like you can hear, and, and it's not that easy to get started, really. I mean, it has quick starts. Uh, it has maybe some advantages, which I haven't tried yet. Uh, in particular, 
there is a host code hosting in Google. And I think you can host the code and run it directly as a cloud function if you deploy it from this console. Like there is a Google console and the Firebase console. And once you deploy it on one, you can't switch to the other. Okay, so that's why it's important to start on the right one. I think it's easier to start on the Firebase one and it's more integrated with what I needed. But there might be advantages to the Google console, which I haven't identified yet. And I think I suspect that the code hosting is one advantage that Firebase doesn't have. So we, we covered um, Google Cloud Functions last week. They are a little slightly different than than, than Firebase ones. And you're right, for, Firebase is a lot easier to get started with. Um, on the Google Cloud Function, you've got an entire GitHub type of an environment that you can use to yes. manage and post code. Uh, yeah, that's what I was uh, suspecting too, right, that you have yeah. the code hosting. And, and once you host it there, you can just uh, deploy it from within there directly, I suppose. Yeah, and not only that, you can also integrate it with the public GitHub if you want, so that if you make a change in your public source code, it automatically refreshes back into the hosting environment within Google Cloud. Okay, yeah, that's a really great uh, advantage. And if you need that, uh, you won't get it if you install it from Firebase. In Firebase, it's more like using command line tools to deploy. Like you say, Firebase, deploy, and your the folder, like, uh, let's say, like really, if you see my desktop, I have a, this is it, right? I have a folder called functions, and in there I have an index. Uh, and then if I go into my command prompt and uh, from this uh, from this uh, directory and say Firebase deploy, then it just uh, puts the code in Firebase. So it's easy to work with, but I guess it's easier if you integrate it with uh, code hosting directly. The, Thank you. The, other, the other thing that you get on the Google Cloud Function side is a, you have a, a built-in virtual machine that you can use for playing around with and before you send your code up to um, to be a cloud function. And you've also got a, an, an simulator, so you can run it locally, well, sort of locally, um, without having to deploy it. I don't know if you've got that in Firebase as well. Yes, in Firebase, you also have a simulator. OK, yeah. Okay. But I, I haven't used the simulator because what I do in Firebase, and especially because it's the free tires, is you create a separate project. Uh, for like your beta or your test project, but yeah. completely with a different console and everything. Yeah. And deploy there and test there. Because at the end, you have to also call uh, third party functions. And when it's hosted locally, sometimes you can't. Uh, so I just don't bother with hosting locally and, and yeah. use a separate console. It's, it's actually not local, it's running on a virtual machine, but it's, but it's sort of local. Ah, because the Firebase one does make a server on your machine and run it there. OK. OK. Well, if you um, want to find out more about games, start with um, Firebase Functions. Um, the uh, session we did last month with Real, uh, we've got it turned into a tutorial as well. So it does the whole step-by-step -step, um, setup that you need for that. So um, uh, you can get started with that. I'm going to hand it over to you, Steve, first, just to get the conversation going, and then we'll uh, we'll bring in uh, Bruce and Rudy, and um, hopefully, Zig, you can stick around because I know you've got a lot of expertise in this area, and you might want to contribute as well. But um, over to you, Steve, first. All right, thank you. Let me share my screen. So we have Google Apps Script, and by default, we are in Google Drive, and we can uh, create a new Google Apps Script where it's a standalone. Um, so let's talk about standalones versus contained scripts. So let's move on. So what we're going to go through here in about 15 minutes is we're going to talk about Google Drive folders where we can have like a production or test folder. And then you can have another folder for developers. So in this case, we're talking about what if you're doing a add-on and it's very popular and now you need a team of developers to help to maintain one or various add-ons. 
So this is a team environment. Uh, so we're going to talk about what is GitHub briefly, and then we're going to introduce um, a Chrome extension that supplements the existing script editor IDE. And then we'll have a setup GitHub to become master source in that Google Drive. And the point there will be, instead of your source being within Google Drive, we're actually going to use a version control software of GitHub. Then we're going to have each developer push to their GitHub branch, which I'll explain in further detail. Then once that's done, you can merge it with the master. And if there are any conflicts among the developers, it can be reconciled there. And then once that's done, we want to have a separate instance for our production or, or our test uh, version, if you will. So in that case, you open up another copy, another instance of, a, of that Google App script. You want to pull in from the version control software okay. from that master. And then finally, you just do your normal Google Apps script publishing. So let's go through some of this in more detail. So keep it in the cloud by creating folders in Google, Google Drive. So one simple way of doing it, okay, I'm going to have a production folder and a, and a list of developers folders. Now, it is possible to have the developer folders independent via another account, but let's just go with this. So then the developers could be someone like Bruce, Martin, myself, or whomever. Um, so there's this like management of version control. And so we want to have these buckets that are separated is the point here. You could have maybe a production environment. You can maybe have a test folder for QA purposes and then the raw development of the code too. Okay, so what is GitHub? Well, you can see here that we're gonna focus on the part of the GitHub of its version control repository. It handles things very nicely. It's widely used. In fact, I think Google themselves use it. So that's what we're gonna focus on. And we're gonna show you how to uh, interact with the script IDE with this version control software. <clears throat> so the way that is done, someone has written a very nice uh, Chrome extension. It's called Google Apps Script GitHub Assistant. And we can provide the link after our broadcast. And once you click that link, it'll be a quick, uh, easy install. And then what you'll notice is when you open up your Google script editor, the IDE, it will now have a supplemental menu options. To, as you can see here to the right of the select function, you'll have a repository, branches, and the ability to push or to pull from. So to set this up, we want to, again, focus on the, the main point here of what we're saying. Google Drive is not the hosting, is not hosting the master source copy, but version control is, right? So we have to have that mindset that the, the, the main source, the Bible, if you will, is, is the GitHub repository. So that's where we trust where all the versions are, and especially our master, okay? So you can use the script IDE to set up a project in GitHub by using the repository branch, which is interesting. So you don't have to spend all your time in GitHub to setting things up. You have some ability to do it within the script IDE itself. For example, in the screenshots here, you could create a repository by clicking the drop down and click create the new repo. And then once that happens, you have a pop up. You can enter the name, description, and if you want public or private, and create. And in a similar sense, you can do the same thing with branches. So each developer could create a branch that is designated for them. So that's what can happen there. Okay, now each developer can push to the designated GitHub branch. All right, so in other words, a developer has their own copy of the latest source. They, then they make edits, and next they need to push the entire code to the GitHub, our version control software. So in this example, I have like Steve version two in the screenshot. So once I make my edits to the code, and while other developers are editing their stuff, what I can do is to say, okay, I'm done with my task of maybe adding a function or, or to my code, let's say. So at this point, we want to uh, push my branch up to that version control software of GitHub. 
Now, I do want to make a point here, as we see in the last uh, sentence here, that once you've done that task, and then you're assigned another task of that source, uh, let's say you have to add another function. Well, you want to make sure you're in sync with the master. So in that case, you say, okay, I'm going to open up my script. I'm going to assume there's been other uh, merging and things like that with other developers. I want to make sure I get the latest code here. So you can click pull from the master to make sure you have the latest instance of the live production environment, let's say. And now when you make your edits, you, you are confident that you're not going to override anything. Now, once you go through and you push a, uh, let's say you added that function to your source code and you pushed it to your, to your branch, there is now work involved to say, well, I want to sync that with the master copy. And this is where the GitHub uh, version control is very nice, right? You can say, okay, I want to um, compare the master with my particular branch. So you choose your branch and then you, then I'll do a demo of this in just a moment. And then you go through a few clicks and then you're done. Now, if there are any conflicts between your code and another developer, which could happen, right? Uh, you can resolve those conflicts right within the GitHub software. <clears throat> okay. So now let's talk about uh, a publisher. So again, we're talking about a team environment of developers. You can have more than one person playing a role of the publisher, but let's define what, what I mean by that. It's the, it's the person who is responsible to copy or migrate or publish to the live production or even test instances. So yes, you could say each developer, you have to do this, or you could say, no, I want a more control in this situation. Maybe I want to wrap it with a change management process that I may have. I want to have a designated publisher. So it could be an independent person. So for example, here, if Bruce and Martin complete respective code edits and we're merged to the master and GitHub, now it's time to pull the changes into a test or live instance. The publisher, let's say maybe I'm playing that role, would open the Google Apps script within the production folder, which is a separate instance, right? And pulls from the master. And then I would just simply perform the normal publishing process that comes out of the box of Google Apps script. You could publish the add-on or a web app. So before we go into questions, let me do a demo. So here we have my production folder and developers folder. And I'm one of the, the uh, developers, Steve. So let's open up a sample project here. And let's say I want to add a new function as my task. Okay. So I just made a change. So I'll click Save. So now I want to make sure I'm going to the right repository which project I want to push it to my developer instance that branch I want to push it up to the github repository it shows me the differences as a confirmation to say yes that's what I did I can enter a comment click push then I get a confirmation now at this point, let's say each developer is responsible to do the merging with the master. So then the developer would open up their GitHub. And this could be private or it could be public. In this case, with GitHub, you can pay a, a service. Uh, I think it's a $7 fee per month to be able to have private um, repositories. So here I have the branch master. I wanna do a pull request. And I want to compare with my branch. And then it brings this up. It's able to merge. And I simply click create my pull request. Now, if there's any conflicts with other developers, uh, this is where you can use this software to resolve the conflicts. So you can learn more about that on your own, but this remains focused on here. So now we just say merge pull request and confirm. And we are done.
So now let's say uh, I'm going to play the role of the publisher, the person who is responsible of getting this update to the either test or live production environment. So let's say we're doing the live production. So this is a separate instance of the source code, separate from the developers. So in this case, I want to open that. Actually, it looks like I used the wrong sample project. I was supposed to do dev, but we can still continue. So let's pretend I did this correctly the first time. So I open up this. So this is the production one. And now we want to pull from the uh, back from the GitHub into the production one. So we will choose the master. I want to pull that in, but of course I have done this out of, out of order here, so I apologize. So let's click pool. It says, okay, I'm going to add a new function. I'm going to pull that in. Then it refreshes the screen. And so this is really, really nice because let's say you have dozens of files here. It's going to update all those files that quickly. So now we're, we're just wrapping things up. It's time to go ahead and deploy it as a web add-on and follow the normal publishing procedures or the web app, what have you. So that's basically it. Are there any questions? Looks like a great integration. Awesome. I, I use GitHub a lot myself and um, it's, it's a Chrome extension I'm, I'm very fond of as well. Um, but um, I suppose uh, that leads on nicely, but it, it leads on nicely to, um, I think what Bruce is gonna talk about for the next um, five minutes, um, where one of the nice things about GitHub is it has its own API. Um, so as well as um, as Steve was doing a very, uh, you know, uh, manual process, it, it is also possible to automate the processes as, as, as well. Um, so, Bruce, I don't know if you want to, to take it from there. I have one question about, one question about the, the Chrome extension. Uh, being a Chrome extension developer myself, uh, I wonder how often it breaks when Google changes their HTML or something. I did take a quick look before the presentation. Actually, I think it was last evening. And the developer of the Chrome extension is very active of making changes and it seems to be being well attended to. So, so far, so good for that. Um, another question from Faustino is um, when you pull um, files from the Git repo, is it going to pull all the files or just um, the files that a, a single it's file? A single that's a good question. It will pull all files. So if if there are 10 developers and you all did different things and you want to update your main production source, you want everything to come over. So it does all files. Okay, so I'm going to uh, talk about automating that bit. I mean, I, I use that same Chrome extension, but I have a slightly different problem in the sense that uh, I have a lot of stuff that I share. And sharing can be quite time consuming and, and hard. Um, on my site, I have a thousand pages of tutorial. Um, and that the, the code for that is in 160 different repos. And those, and those repositories use 50 different libraries. So juggling all that stuff manually would be kind of a nightmare. Um, and Obviously, if I update a library, I want to make sure that the project that uses that library has got the source code of the library as well as its own source code. So there's no there's no dependencies that are needed. Um, you know, so you don't download a, a a project and then find out you need libraries that you don't have and everything. It's all in the same the same repository. So this is what I'm trying to to juggle. Uh, so I have something that runs every day and automatically does all that. So we'll just take a quick look at, at that. Um, the, the steps are, first of all, it does an extraction, 
which takes which looks at all scripts that I've published, which are in a particular directory, as you can see a, sn a snip of it here. And it takes those uh, those scripts, those Google App scripts, and extracts out from that all the scripts that are within it. So each project will generate multiple files, usually quite quite a number of files. The next thing it does is to resolve the libraries that are being used by those projects. So if I'm using one of my libraries in a project, it's going to go off and find out what where that is and where its source code is as well. And it's also going to create a doc, an auto documentation of the dependencies for a project, which we'll look at in a minute as well. And then the next step is to take the, you can see this, this, this last column of file names. These are the scripts that have been pulled out of a particular project. And I then want to automatically push that to GitHub for each of the 160 repositories that I've that I've got going at any one time. So that's that's the the steps, and of course that's just one thing, one trigger, one app script trigger that runs every night to do all that. So and the auto documentation, we'll look at the actual one in a minute, but you can see that in GitHub itself, it creates a list of all the dependencies for a particular project, what the project key is, the version, and all that type of stuff. So that's easy to see everything that's being used by a particular project. And it also looks at which advanced services, Google services, I should say, that are being used in that project and, and uh, documents them as well. So that if you happen to want to set up a, a brand new project, you, you've got all the data you need here to be able to do that. So how does it work? Well, um, in my nightly trigger, I've got various settings that say where to look for scripts that are published, where to put them to. And then I've got a few other things that are needed to, to for automation that are not that relevant. But my trigger um, batch program, you can see on the right there, it's three things. It's do the extraction. In other words, pull out all the files from each project do the libraries, which is to find out which libraries are being used by any project, and then do git, which is to push it up to, to, to GitHub. And down at the bottom, you've got the contribution history of this stuff. So it's 4,800 contributions in the last year that have all been done um, automatically without me even really noticing. So another good thing that it gives me, of course, is I can, since I've got all those files available, I can do some visualization of dependencies and so on. So this is an app script um, uh, app that's looking at what is it? It's an HTML service app using d3.js. And it's looking at all my projects. And it's looking at all the dependencies. So for example, if I wanted to see, I don't know, um, any one of these things, take that one. I can see that this particular project is using those five libraries. And then I could maybe pick a library, that one. That's only used in one. Let's get a different one. Um, that one's here. And I can see all the projects that access that particular library. So as a kind of a side product of having done all that stuff in GitHub, I can now do all this kind of uh, things to dig into things that are related to each other. So let's have a quick look at. Um, the GitHub repository. This is this is the repository for the actual software that we just looked at. In fact, so it's always got the same format. Um, it's got libraries. These are all the. This is all the code for all the libraries that are referenced by this particular project. So this is completely standalone. So you've got it's pulled in the latest versions of all the source code for the libraries it looks at, and the other thing it's got. Of course, the scripts is for the project itself. So these are the each one of the projects in the IDE. Um, but very handily, it's got this dependencies file, which it's created automatically as well. And it's so it's going to tell you all the uh, the script files that are in that project. It's going to tell you the references that it it references directly. And if you want to, you can go and have a look at the source code there, what the versions are. Um, and then it's got other dependencies because, of course, those libraries themselves might access other libraries. So it's got those things shown here. 
and it's got whichever Google services it's using. So that's kind of it, because uh, it's really um, maintenance free. I really just don't have to do anything much to this at all. The only thing that happens is that occasionally um, Google change their their dependencies, how their dependencies work. Because the way, if you if you noticed it went off to figure out, I was using, happened to be using the Drive Advanced service for that. It had to go off and find out which, into the inside of uh, Google Apps Script IDE, to find out which ones were being referenced. And they changed that from time to time. So that sometimes you need to do a little bit of a hack to figure out how that works when they change it. Um, but aside from that, it's it's uh, it's fairly maintenance free. And the final thing is that if you want to, you'll notice that of my three steps, the last one was to push it up to Git. This do Git. Um, if you want to use the Git client itself, as opposed to automatically doing that, then you can just run. Instead of doing that, you can you can do a Git push uh, in the normal way that you would do if you had been doing this manually. And that's it. Any questions? I, I think there is general um, um, wonderment at, at what you've been able to achieve, Bruce. Partic for me, um, you know, you, you've been able to visualize your dependencies as well, I think, is, um, uh, ticks huge boxes for me. Um, but yeah, uh, I'll... but having said that, the, 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 the doing that kind of stuff is really quite easy if you've got the input files that allow you to do it in the first place because each um, project starts with a thing I call info.json which describes the project in mammoth detail mm -hmm. um, and then you can just use that to, to visualize so I'm not actually looking at it uh, when it does that visualization it's not really looking at the projects it's looking at the info.json's for every project it, so is there much in terms of the info.json is that something that you manually have to write yourself or? no no that, that that gets that gets created automatically as well the only thing you need to do is that small setup that i showed you in one of those slides that said where your files are yeah uh, so where your files are and how to log into github and you're done uh, impressive stuff i think it's nice as well to um see the two different approaches here that you know steve was talking about at you know at managing a, a, a team environment where um you're working on code together. I suppose with your example, Bruce, it, it works because you're the single developer, so. Well, actually I use um, Steve's method as well for when I'm developing, um, so that I can have test and development and all the rest of it, even though typically I'm the only person working on it. Um, but then once I've got a production version, that goes into my published script. My published script place is the equivalent of production that Steve was showing. Um, and then that's that's what automatically gets replicated to to those repositories, not the working stuff, if you see. Mm -hmm. OK, this is the presentation I wish I had a year ago, <laughs> a year ago when I got started. Um, if for the, anyone new out there who might be listening, um, I have three key messages for you. One, you can definitely do this Two. This is a good way to start. And three, check out the link at the end of the presentation. First off, here's a good reading list to get started with, especially item two. It's very deep and it comes from the folks at Zen Hub. And if you went through this and you did some homework, you played around and experimented, you might end up with this basic stack for doing your own dev flow. So I'm, I'm looking at doing Google Sheets add-ons and then again, you'll see some of the same concepts that were mentioned earlier, where you're using GitHub to host the origin or truth repository. You're using GitFlow, so inside of that origin, you have a master and a develop branch that you're always using. And then you're following GitFlow rules for making updates, which means you're creating separate branches and merging them into, into develop and then putting them into master following some conventions that, that have worked for a while. Uh, let's see, Zen Hub, basically it integrates natively with GitHub's user interface. It's a layer of planning without the context switching. It's, I think it's very good. So far, so good. Um, the work you do locally, if you're working locally, I like to use Atom 
It's a uh, hackable code editor. I think for other reasons, people might want to use Eclipse because it's better integrated. Um, and then Git Kraken, which is a Git GUI. Uh, it's really fabulous. Uh, let's see. Then if you're working in the web editor, um, as we saw earlier, so these presentations are complementary. Um, if, if you're working in the Google script editor, you want to use the, the GAS GitHub Assistant to interact with your remote repository. What does it look like? Let's look at some screenshots. Here's Git Kraken on Mac. You see that the branch history is, uh, first of all, it's visual. Uh, it's uh, oriented vertically with the newest on the top. And uh, on your left, you know, you can see what's local. You can see what's remote. Um, and then you can see the tags that have been applied. Um, and then also you see that Git flow. They have a, a, a Git flow layer. Uh, so you can start uh, releases, hot fix, hot fixes or features. Um, let's see. Oh, I did want to mention um, the cost is very low. Uh, you can you could do it for free if you're using public repos. If you pay a little bit of money, you can have private repos, and Git Kraken will let you manage uh, merge conflicts inside of its tool. Here's a Zen board, a Zen Hub's task board. I like to call it a Zen board. It's a, they have seven default pipelines that you push your issues through and you can learn all about that. It's sort of a post agile scrub approach. Uh, moving on. Oh, as you can see in the top here, you see boards. So um, Zen Hub literally is a Chrome extension that injects its, its functionality inside of GitHub. So it's seamless. It feels like it's part of GitHub, which is a very interesting approach. Um, the next one is, this is a look at the Atom editor itself. Um, it can interact directly uh, with your repos, or you can manage all that via Git Kraken, which is what I do. Um, it, uh, this was just talked about. Let me, next slide. Here's a list of practices that you want to employ. Uh, more or less, the overall approach is that you're using Zen Hub task boards or Zen boards instead of GitHub projects. You're using GitHub issues as if they were work tickets or user stories, and you're using uh, GitHub milestones um, as your sprints. Uh, let's see here. You want to key things to make it work. You want to have a label scheme that goes beyond types. You, you might want to do some automation. Um, to standardize some naming conventions, uh, and you want to implement some templates as well on GitHub. Here's the label scheme I'm using right now. Probably the highlight of it, uh, two things. Um, there's a tool, a link to a tool that allows you to copy labels between repos, very handy. Um, probably the thing I like best about my own label scheme is uh, that there's a set for complexity. So the, the, I associate t-shirt sizes, uh, which is a borrowed idea. And then I put ranges of story points. So story points are ways to estimate that are unitless um, because people are better at comparing um, relative sizes. And then Zen Hub has injected in your issue a milestone field for you to actually put what the estimate is. This is how Zen Hub runs their backlog of issues through their pipelines. And you'll notice that uh, your product backlog would have, um, once it has enough detail, it floats up to the top in priority and detail. Once it has uh, an estimate and a milestone, and or excuse me, once it's been assigned to a milestone, you're basically running a sprint. Somebody working on it pulls it into progress and keeps working. <clears throat> Here's an example of what the semantic versioning would look like. Um, more on that later. Things to watch out for. Well, I would say one thing about semantic versioning. Um, I like to use it in my commit titles because um, it, it's really handy to follow. So not just the major releases where you have like um, x.y.z, right? Um, I go dash, the change topic, and then dot iteration number. And so that works whether it's a hotfix or a feature. And when I see them in the commits histories, it just sort of orients you. Uh, there's a list of things to watch out for, uh, like merging Zen boards. Uh, we didn't stuff we didn't talk about. 
um, closing issues, some gotchas, um, a few notes on releases and versioning, uh, which is an important note, basically. You're, well, we'll get into that another time. Uh, what's next? Go to this repo and you'll find uh, the starter templates that are in there, the label scheme that I mentioned. If you star and watch it for ongoing updates, um, what I think I'm gonna do is, is update this DevFlow repo to maybe also do demos or something in the future. And then as I do that, I try to model what the dev flow looks like. Um, so that's a public repo. And then the slides are up there. There's a, a PDF link. You can download it. And all of the links that were listed are live. Uh, seven minutes. Any questions? <laughs> I think it adds another lovely flavor to you know how, how you can approach this. And um, it's, it's clearly a topic that you've You've um, you've spent a lot of time getting to grips with. I, I wonder if uh, Steve Bruce, you you have any comments? Yeah, um, does you know one of the things you'll find with GitHub is that because everyone uses it, regardless of which language they're using, and everything else, like zillions of people use it. There's massive amounts of add-ons and tools and everything else that you can use to make your development experience wonderful. Uh, and you know, I, th I think it's if if you're not using GitHub, then you really should. It's it's quite hard to get started with, and but and I would say that if you introduce too many tools at the beginning, um, before you realize the fundamentals of GitHub, you might get a little bit confused. So I would say start slowly, get to know GitHub, and then add some of the wonderful tools that are out there to organize your life, as as Rudy has clearly done. Uh, Rudy, do you want to just respond to Bruce's comment? Yeah, that's fine. I just um, I would definitely like to to model later, like how you how I'm keeping my semantic version inside the code, and then how I'm using that everywhere else. Like in in analytics, it writes to it. Um, how how I'm managing that and what it looks and feels like because it's um, I think if people can see it, it's a lot better. So I wanted to sort of you know slice the cake all the way, and so I hope this this repo would be a way to. Um, to evolve exactly, formalize what I think is a workflow for me, um, and it helps me, it helps me move on to more stuff. So, I, I appreciate the time. And if anyone takes a look at it, star and follow my first public repo. Thank you. <laughs> we'll be there. Zach, Zach, did I saw you unmuted your video? I, I didn't know you uh, went. Yes. No, you just so I I thought it was great. Um, I will look at it into in detail and try to start using it um, because it looks very very helpful cool thanks and it's, it's awesome that that uh, it's integrated into uh, that that people. thanks and and i would add um when i thought of this topic for today it's one of those things let's continue the conversation so there's a lot of people leveraging GitHub with things like AppScript, for example. So please give us feedback, and maybe on the next episode, we can share some of those other processes that you have. So thanks. I have one question for you, Rudy. So um, you mentioned Git Kraken, I think, there as a, a desktop um, tool. So I use the um, GitHub also have, I, I certainly know for Windows, they have a, a desktop application that you can use um, that Put some nice kind of skin on this. Uh, did you look at the official GitHub offering before choosing Git Kraken? Is there anything in Git Kraken that you think aces it? Um, let's see. Um, you're talking about the um, the GitHub desktop. Yeah. Um, yeah. I liked what I liked about it is that I could um, just click and open my repo directly from it, right? Um, but I find that. Um, that get get Kraken is 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 much more powerful. It's it's basically it's basically Git. It's a visual version of Git, and um, you know because I was intimidated by the command line of Git, and yeah. you know it took me some time to to kind of appreciate what was going on with Git. But that's why I, I really appreciate like the reading that I listed. You know, if you go and read, you know, Git Flow was something that guy was using. Published a post in 2010 about, and you start to see it, you know, become popular, and you just like get pull step back and think about the concept and then look at the tool it starts to make more sense and i'm still trying to shake out you know shake out my dev flow too right as far as the versioning goes and and 
but but for me as a as somebody with a with a process background it's all about reducing the friction and improving the visibility and and some of the the standardizing the way you're using things like like uh maybe in another session i'll show you know i put some code in there where you can um sort of make make your code ready for testing so say you open up a new uh, a new sheet or excuse me a new script and you you pull your work in there you could make it ready and it will use your apply your standards to naming of the script and grab you a default sheet uh, using the same name so that when you publish to test as add-on right you're you're doing this cleanly and it's really easy to clean up after yourself you could also put like uh, base cases of data for example mm -hmm. uh, but to your question yeah um, the uh, for me yeah I like to get cr get cracking better especially after I realize you know once I double click on uh, on a head so I'm checking out and moving the head to a particular branch um, I just swap over to to Adam and I'm, it, that's where I'm at in, in Adam so yeah. it works it works pretty well although I haven't been able to really use Adam to actively actively code and get feedback from you know from the uh, from the compiler uh, on the uh, if that's the right word <laughs> on the on the Google side but uh, but it works out because right I, I push if I'm working on a feature branch I push it um, as was demonstrated earlier, um, you know, I push it to to the cloud editor, right? And then I make changes there. And then when, if I'm happy with them, I increment my my I iterate my semantic version, and I push that back back to the branch, which is temporarily pushed up to the to the origin. And you know, it it really works for managing changes. Yeah. Uh, does uh, Adam have the all complete? I think I saw a request for this a, a long time ago. I did. Is is that there yet? Uh, the autocomplete? No, um, it's not. Um, as far as you mean autocomplete in the namespacing of Google's yeah. uh, API services? No, it's not. I, I do remember a long time ago when I was looking at this, I saw somebody um, mention that you could download it. Um, the 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 download it and use it it wouldn't be always perfectly up to date but it'd be good enough for for autocomplete but i haven't seen an answer to that they, they, there is something available in Eclipse, i think that um as a, a plugin so there is there is something that could be um you know that is packageable that you know the the Eclipse one google developed and released um but i i think as steve says um this has been a really interesting conversation to start and i think um it would be good to to continue it unfortunately i'm conscious of time so um, thank um zig uh steve bruce and rudy for your your contributions um to to this week's or this month's episode um and um we've already got the next episode of totally unscripted um in the block so um we've got uh, another i think hopefully stimulating and uh, inspiring topic um, we've got uh, Waka Ahmed um, who's been doing uh, some work with api.ai which is um, a way to create conversational intelligent apps so to actually through voice or or text input um, um, do wonderful things in terms of getting input so anyway there's more details about that show on our uh, totally unscripted website Hopefully you can tune in. That'll be on August the fourth. Um, at the same time, uh, we'll we've got another vacant slot for that session. So perhaps we'll revisit um, the, this whole theme here of um, professionalization. Um, and um, with that, I think uh, we'll call it a day. So thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Great Thanks.